Okay, folks, this is going to be picking up with section 2.4, the second half of it. Uh, we're talking about the law of syllogism. Okay, first we talked about the law of detachment. Um, previously, now it's the law of syllogism. These two things are going to be, they're going to go hand in hand with one another as we work through um, the duration of this course and really through all of mathematics. Uh, so the second law allows you to state a conclusion from two true conditional statements when the conclusion of one statement is the hypothesis of the other statement. I think that gets wordy, but I think you'll be able to see with these examples exactly what this process is, um, entails. Um, and symbols, it just means if you have some hypothesis P and it gives you Q or it implies Q, if that is true, if you know that to be a true statement, okay? Um, maybe it's like and we've been using this, this, this if then, as if it is raining, then the ground is wet. If that's true, if you know that's 100% true, and then you have another statement that says, if the ground is wet, then it's slippery. You know that is true. Then what you can say is a new, completely different statement. Completely new, different statement, but also be guaranteed to know that it's already true. And that new statement for us, if it was, so this would have said, if it is raining, then the ground is wet. This says the ground is wet, then it is slippery. The new thing that we can say is, if it is raining, then it is slippery. And you can see there that that's like a real life situation that we we process that kind of thought and that type of logic all of the time. Whether we sit down and actually think about like is that like the train of thought that we go through? Usually, it's it's not. It's like subconscious. We we just we just know that to be true. Um, but if we analyze it, we dig it apart, um, that's really, that's, that's that's how we make decisions and go about our day and um, understand true situations in, in our everyday lives using this law. Uh, here's another one, just a basic elementary example. It says if it is July, then you're on summer vacation, okay? So you've got a true if-then statement. The next if-then statement, you see that this conclusion matches this hypothesis, okay? But it says if you are on summer vacation, then you work at a smoothie shop, okay? So if we read these, if, we, if these are both true, and we read them together, if it's July, then you're on summer vacation. If you're on summer vacation, then you work at a smoothie shop. So then we can make the argument, we can go straight from this, Dada. straight to this, Dada. and we have a new Dada. statement that if it is July, then you work at a smoothie shop. Sorry about this. All right, so that was that was my youngest daughter, and see that it's twelve in the morning. Um, so, what can you conclude from the given? So, just got some examples here of this. Um, it says if a figure is a square, then the figure is a rectangle. So, what we're trying to do here is uh, take this true statement. If it's a if it's a square, then it's rectangle. That is a true statement. Now we'll get into why that is true later on, uh, like chapter five and chapter six. Uh, but that is true. If a figure is a rectangle, the figure has four sides. That is also true. And that one, I think you guys don't need any explanation of why. But what we're doing is we're trying to say, okay, does does this hypothesis? Or sorry. My, rephrase that. That conclusion does that conclusion match this hypothesis? Okay, so it does. Those 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 match directly. So then, what you can do, and this is what I like to do. So you see that I've highlighted the things that are matching. <clears throat> then the new argument that I can actually make is the stuff that I haven't highlighted. So just highlight that way. And now my my new phrase, my new if then that is completely different that comes from the law of syllogism is if a figure is a square, then the figure has four sides. Um, we I think we use an example. I I, I talked about um the the transitive property the other day at the end of class. Um transitive property says something like this says if A equals B and B equals C, then 
A equals C. Which hopefully that makes sense. Let's say if um, let's say Mr. Fay is the same age as um, Mr. Markley. We're not. He's older than me. Uh, then. So, Mr. Fay is the same age as Mr. Markley. Mr. Markley is 38 years old. So, if you if you piece these together, Mr. Fay is the same as Mr. Markley, but Mr. Markley is 38. Can you make the argument that Mr. Fay is 38? I think you can. I think that's pretty easy to see. And that's that's kind of the transitive property that we've talked about. Um, usually what we'll say with the transitive property is something like segment AM is the same as segment MB, but segment MB is like 12 units. Well, you can make the argument, well, AM is the same as MB, but MB is 12, so the AM is 12. And you get a new statement. You, kind of piecing those first and last things together. It's a lot of syllogism. That's what's going on here. Okay, we have two truths. This part here matches that part. So then link the initial if statement with the, the final then statement, and you get a new overall argument or conjecture. Uh, here's one that says, uh, if you do gymnastics, then you are flexible. If you do ballet, then you are flexible. Now, one thing I got to you got to pay attention to is that these things are not they're not depend their order is independent. Uh meaning if they don't match the way I've gotten them written here as this being the this being the first statement and then obviously this one being the second one, if they don't match that way or conclusion to the first the second hypothesis, then you can flip their order and see if they match that way. So we're going to do that in this one. Um uh, because I think you can see here it says Here's the conclusion of this first if then. So we're going to say these are two true if then. You might be able to argue because it's a particular real life scenario and there might be degrees of this. You do gymnastics and you are flexible. Well, what does flexible mean? All that kind of thing. But we're going to say that this is true. And we're going to say that this is true. Okay. Um, but if I look at you are flexible and you do ballet, those are completely different things. Okay. So they do not match. So the law of syllogism does not allow me to create a new statement here. Okay. Um, so then the question is, well, what if I do it this way? What if I take that phrase? And the second one, okay, so obviously this is the order that they are in, and we didn't get a conclusion. We couldn't create a, uh, a new statement, a new if then statement that I, I would know to be true. So then let's flip the order, and let's ask ourselves now, does the hypothesis, I keep saying it, the, the conclusion of this one doesn't match the hypothesis of this one. And basically what we're trying to do, I keep saying hypothesis first, is we're trying to match one hypothesis to another statement's conclusion. And if they match, then we've got a new phrase. But if you are flexible and you do gymnastics, those don't match either. Okay, they're not They're not the same thing. If this was going to work, this one would have to say you are flexible and this one would have to say, you are flexible. Okay? Um, so because in any particular order, these two statements do not have a conclusion that matches a hypothesis, so there's no new statement I can make. There's no a third if-then that I would know to be true. Okay? So if, my hope is that you guys can kind of see what we're kind of getting here. We've talked about, like, when we do definitions, 
to create a definition, to, to understand a new vocabulary word, I have to have building blocks. I have to have previous vocabulary words. Um, you know, if I want to create the vocab word of a segment, then I have to have knowledge of what points and lines uh, and those types of things are. So we had to have previous knowledge. This idea here is allowing us to kind of use previous knowledge to build new ideas that I know have to be inherently true because of the law of syllogism. Here's just an example of, of how we use law of syllogism and the law of detachment together. Um, so it says, and this, you're going to see several questions in your homework that are like this. They're going to give you a couple if-then statements. And you're going to see, can I create, through the use of the law of syllogism, a third statement? And then they'll give you something else. Essentially, they'll give you that statement there. And you'll see, does that match my law of syllogism argument? So we'll just kind of do this one. It says, if you live in, I'm not sure how to pronounce these things, Accra, then you live in Ghana. Okay. If you live in Ghana, then you live in Africa. Okay. So here is one if-then statement. We'll highlight the other one in green. If you live in Ghana, then you live in Africa. And now we can see that if I look at this conclusion, it matches this hypothesis. So what that allows me to do, then I'll highlight this in yellow. What that allows me to do is make this new if-then statement, which is completely new than the two that they gave us. And think about this. This makes sense. If you live in Accra, then you live in Ghana. Well, Ghana is this little country right here, okay, right there. So if you live in Accra, which is a city inside Ghana, and because Ghana is in Africa, then you must, because you live in Accra, also live in Africa. So that gives us this phrase, if you live in Accra, then you live in Africa. Okay. Um, now, looking at this thing here, with our yellow statement, if you live in Accra, then you live in Africa, it's now going to ask you, can we, so creating this yellow one was the law of syllogism. Now, given this blue statement, can we make a final argument? says, I think Asia lives in Accra, or Asa lives in Accra. Well, because of this yellow statement, someone that lives in Accra must live in Africa. So now, our new conclusion is that this person lives in Africa. And that's the, that's using the, again, then the law of detachment. So the law of syllogism first gave me this yellow one. That yellow one combined then with this Next statement, using a little detachment, allows me to make a final conclusion about this person. So we'll kind of keep doing the same thing here with these. Um, says, what can you conclude from the given true statement? Says, if it's raining outside, then there are clouds in the sky. And then they give me one more statement. Says, it is raining today. Well, that is matching that phrase right there. So this is the law of detachment. Law of detachment and because they match then you can say based on today's information that there are clouds in the sky b says if malcolm scores at least an 85 on his final exam then you want an a for the term malcolm scores a 90 on his final exam so again there's just one if then statement here and then a second um statement okay um i think in English class, you called that, that second statement a declarative statement, um, declaring something that is happening. Um, does that blue statement, does that match this if-then statement? And like I said earlier, they don't have to be verbatim, but they have to be concept for concept. So Malcolm scores at least an 85 on his final exam. Does my declarative statement down here match that? 90%? Is that at least an 85? Yes, it is. So now my conclusion about Malcolm is that he's going to earn an A for the term. 
Part C says if two angles are vertical, then they are congruent. So again, one if then statement, and then a declarative statement. So there's my declarative statement. Does that declarative statement match that hypothesis? Here it says if two angles are vertical, then they are congruent. So angle three and angle four are vertical angles. Well, they match. So what can I say about three and four? They are congruent. Um, here's some stuff that maybe you guys have done previously and maybe when you first started learning how to divide and doing quick mental math. It says if a number is divisible by 12, then it's divisible by 6. Okay. If a number is divisible by 6, then it's divisible by 3. Let's see if we have a conclusion here. Does this conclusion, so that's the conclusion of the first if-then statement. Does it match the hypothesis of the second if-then statement? And it does. This blue one matches the green one. So that's a, a conclusion matching a hypothesis. So then what we're left with is everything here I'm going to underline in blue. And that would be the law of syllogism. It allows me to say if a number is divisible by 12, then it is also divisible by 3. Okay. Um, you know, see if that's... Because these first two were true, that's automatically going to be true. But see if we have like 36. If it's divisible by 12, 36 divisible by 12 gives me 3. 36 must have been divisible by 3 as well then. That's what this new law, this new statement is saying. This new if then, then we have underlined in blue. And it, it does. 36 does divide by, um, by 3. If I go you know, 48 divided by 12, that gives me 4. That must mean that 48 is also divisible by 3. And it is. It gives me 16. Okay. Um, so if a square, a figure is a square, then the figure is a parallelogram. Okay. Um, and let me actually cut this one out again. Copy. All right, so looking at it in the way that it's structured, it says if a figure is a square, then the figure is a parallelogram. And that's a true statement. Um, I'm going to see, does this conclusion match this hypothesis? If a figure is a parallelogram, and then a figure is a rectangle. Okay, and Those are different because a parallelogram is not necessarily a rectangle, but a rectangle is always a parallelogram. So those those are not word for word the same, or concept for concept the same thing. So those don't match. So there's nothing I can say here yet. Okay. So let's flip the statements. Let's flip their order, because they might match in this order. So I'm going to match, or look at this conclusion, the figure is a parallelogram, and then figure is a square. And again, just because the figure is a parallelogram, that is not the same thing as being a square, and a square is not the same thing as being a parallelogram. So those don't match. So this is actually a situation they give you two true if-then statements, but because the conclusion does not match a hypothesis, you have no law of syllogism at play here, and there's no new statement that can be created. A lot of times you get questions that and if you really struggle with this, um, I like to put things in terms of like geography because I think that's something that we're familiar with. Um, it says if you live in Cincinnati, then you live in Ohio. So if you live in Cincinnati, then you live in Ohio. I think we all would agree with that. If you live in Ohio, then you live in the United States. Okay? Uh, and then it says Ken lives in Cincinnati. So if we look at two if-then statements, does this conclusion, does that conclusion 
match this hypothesis. I think we could agree that they do. So then everything else in the two statements merged together would be my law of syllogism. So it says if you live in Cincinnati, then you live in USA. So that would be a new statement using the law of syllogism. Okay. And it's true because the first two were true. The first two if thens were true. There was a matching conclusion to a to a matching hypothesis. So then this has to be true. Now the declarative statement says Ken lives in Cincinnati. Does that match that? And it does, so the law of detachment says you can make now a new conclusion about Ken. And that new conclusion you can make about Ken because this declarative statement matches this true if part, this true hypothesis, is now you can make the conclusion that is inside this if-then statement about Ken. So I can say Ken lives in the USA. And that's why I think that'd be obvious, but you can see then that train of thought that we actually go through when we say something like this, or we, we make this argument. Um, it's a lot, if we can understand this, it's going to make our our mathematical principles that we kind of sew together or stitch together to create new principles uh, it makes that process a lot easier if we can understand it kind of on this, um, these general terms, these more elementary, uh, everyday kind of life examples.